court. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Good morning, Your Honors. The matter before the court this morning is the case entitled In Ray Morrisville Hydroelectric Project Water Quality Certificate, docket number 2018-339. Representing the appellant, State of Vermont, is Laura Murphy. Representing the appellant, Vermont Natural Resources Council and Vermont Council of Trout Unlimited, is Jill Heaps. Also seated at council table is Jeff Crocker. Representing the appellee American Whitewater is Ron Shems. Representing the appellee Morrisville Water and Light is Greg Eaton. Okay, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Nice to see so many people here for the first hearing. We'll get started. Uh, please, council, come on up. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court. Thank you. I'm Laura Murphy for the Agency of Natural Resources. And I have with me here today Jeff Crocker. He is the Stream Flow Protection Coordinator for the agency. Thank I'll be sharing my time today with Council for Vermont Natural Resources Council and Trout Unlimited. I will address anti-degradation generally and high quality aquatic habitat. There are two questions the court needs to decide in this case. And they are centered on the important obligation this 401 certification presents to restore the waters at issue. The first question is whether the Environmental Division misinterpreted and misapplied Vermont's anti-degradation policy, and the answer is yes. The next question is whether the Environmental Division should have deferred the agency's interpretation of and development of conditions to protect high quality aquatic habitat, and the answer again is yes. Do I understand a designate? Tell me what the difference is between a designated use and an existing use. A designated use is a use that the state designates for a particular water body as a use to be achieved and attained. And the federal regulations provide very specific guidance about what needs to be a designated use. It starts with the goal of the Clean Water Act, one of which is to um, ensure the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife. And then if we move to the federal regulations, EPA's regulations require states to designate an aquatic life use for a water body unless the state goes through a use attainability analysis, which is a separate procedure I'm happy to talk about doesn't apply here. So that's a designated use. An existing use is a use, so if we have the designated uses here, we have to write conditions to ensure the level of water quality to protect these designated uses. For that uses. specific designated use. Exactly. An existing use is any use that has actually been achieved in the water body since November 1975, which is when the original anti-deg regulations came into play, that has actually been achieved in the water body since that time. And the and way- it has nothing to do with a facility, whether it's been in, in existence before 79. Before 75, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. Yes. That's correct. And so, and and when, and so just starting with anti-degradation, the the designated uses is is really the agency's obligation to write conditions to protect the level of water quality necessary to protect protect the most sensitive use. So this goes back to the aquatic life use designation. It's part of Vermont's water quality standards. If we look at the hydrology criteria, which do apply here. The baseline, the goal, is the natural flow regime. If we look at the um, aquatic biota criteria for Class B waters, the reference condition is minimally impacted conditions. So we're always striving to move waters toward their natural conditions sufficient to support this most sensitive use. With that in mind, what difference does it make if the hydro generation is an existing use or not? It doesn't, well, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's an existing or a designated use. The way it should matter, and the this is not how the Environmental Division interpreted anti-degradation, but the way it should matter, and this is actually a point that Vermont Natural Resources Council made in its brief, is if you are permitting an upstream facility, that upstream facility, the conditions in that permit would need to take into account the downstream hydroelectric facility. Again, assuming it's an existing use entitled to protection. And it would need to take it into account in the sense of 
ensuring a high level of water quality, which includes flow. Flow is an important part of water quality. Ensuring the water is close to its natural flow regime, partly in, in large part to protect aquatic biota, but then that flow will be in the river when it reaches a hydroelectric facility. It means there's high water quality in the river. It doesn't mean, and this is where the environmental division fundamentally misunderstood the water quality standards, it doesn't mean the existing use gets to take the water out of the river and lower water quality. And the environmental divisions, division's approach on this was really unprecedented. Um, no one has pointed to a case or a permitting decision where a condition was imposed that requires lower water quality in order to support the use that's causing the lower water quality. Understanding that quality encompasses flow, is it generally the rule of thumb that more flow is higher, equals higher quality? I, I would say probably yes, generally, but not necessarily. And it really depends on, again, what's the natural flow regime? Is the natural flow regime one prone to high flows or not? Is a different type of waterway, a different set of conditions? And there is also a point at which um, even if high flow is a component of water quality, and there was testimony about this, there's a point at which water quality, particularly with respect to aquatic habitat, de de begins to decline over a certain flow level. And is that the issue with the white water releases? That is the issue with the white water re releases, yes. And, and the real heart of the issue there, and it, so the environmental division, um, in addition to just imposing that condition at Katie's Falls, not the white water releases condition, but the condition at Katie's Falls, that there's no dispute, doesn't support aquatic biota. The Environmental Division also used this anti-degradation interpretation to impose the scheduled releases. And the issue there is that there wasn't a showing that scheduled releases provide higher water quality than what we're striving to achieve with the aquatic biota. It, there wasn't a showing that those releases are actually closer to the natural flow regime. How do you figure out, I mean, the, 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 I was having a hard time getting my head around natural flow regime in a world where we're damming up the water and, and it's already fundamentally not the natural flow regime. And then we're making decisions about when and how to release it. I guess I'm having a hard time understanding why scheduled releases are any more incompatible with the natural flow regime than some other re regime that um, is dictated by a permit rather than nature. They they wouldn't necessarily have to be. So there was testimony that one particular type of scheduled release, a time-shifted release, and that's where essentially it rains, so we have natural high flow, and then that's saved in the reservoir and passed downstream later. A time-shifted release conceivably could, um, if five particular factors are met, and I'm not gonna remember what they all are, but it's related to depth, velocity, amplitude and magnitude, timing, duration, if those factors are met in keeping with the natural flow regime, potentially a scheduled release could be um, more in keeping with the natural flow regime. But that showing wasn't made at the trial court, um, and American Whitewater had an opportunity to present specific. So, and I, I, there's a little bit of a burden, burden question here. Right. Um, there aren't really findings either way as to the. I, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that the scheduled releases would degrade the water, as I understand degradation to be we understood here. There was some testimony that it might, depending on the, the, the level of the flow, but I, court certainly didn't make those findings. Well, and the question isn't really will it de degrade water quality. The question is will it support aquatic biota? Because whatever conditions are imposed, whether it's by the court or by the agency, they have to be shown to actually support the aquatic life use. Right. I was using those as synonymous, that, that, that it, it wasn't incompatible with the criteria for maintaining aquatic biota. At this stage, I would say that it is, and that's because the showing hasn't been made that scheduled releases in this waterway can be done in a manner to support aquatic biota. And we're also, it's important to remember, not just talking about the river, but also talking about the reservoir. So the burden is on the party seeking the condition rather than on the party not seeking to not have the condition? I and mean, that's what I'm trying to figure out the Correct. Burden. In terms of, the, because the American Whitewater is putting forth the scheduled releases as a permit condition, because they're the proponent of the condition, they have the burden to show that those conditions will in fact meet aquatic biota. And this, there's some discussion of this, and there's nothing exactly on point for 401 certification, but 
Um, actually, there is. I, I correct myself. In the Lamoille River hydroelectric case, this was a Water Resources Board decision. In the merits decision, which we cited in our opening brief, the court there, sorry, the Water Resources Board there talks about who has the burden when someone is proposing a condition that the agency hasn't proposed, and it's the proponent. And that our, um, we believe that burden hasn't been met here. In addition, the agency's conditions for whitewater releases um, pass natural high flows downstream in summer and fall. They're required to be passed downstream. In addition, in the spring, once the reservoir has refilled, they're required to be passed downstream. The only time natural high flows that would actually support whitewater boating aren't required to be passed downstream is in the winter, at which point they could be passed downstream. Do you agree that there was a factual dispute at the trial um, as to the um, results of the, the high water let goes for the white water rafting as to whether that did affect the aquatic biota? It seems to me there were facts on both sides with respect to that and the court made a factual finding. So they, I believe there were facts on both sides that weren't specific. The, one of the problems is American, with the scheduled releases, there weren't proposed specific, specific components of those scheduled releases, those five factors that would ensure aquatic life use is met, essentially. And so there wasn't a discussion about specifics. There was certainly a discussion about generally, we have concerns about high flows, in particular the peaking flows, where you switch from low flows to high flows. That has impacts on um, life stages of species like um, young uh, spawning and incubation. They, they can't move to find better habitat. So there was, there was definitely testimony about that, but there weren't specific facts regarding the actual conditions because we didn't have those five factors at play. And then I, I move on to deference if I could. Well, I just want to follow up question. Sure. I mean, wasn't there also evidence that We've been living in a world with scheduled releases for quite some time that bring about those sudden uh, flow fluctuations, and in fact, the aquatic biota has been supported under those conditions. And isn't that a fact that the Corps could rely on in saying that this uh, use is fully consistent with the high quality that we're requiring, meaning supporting the aquatic biota? No, and that actually bleeds very nicely into the issue about deference and high quality aquatic habitat. So there are two problems with relying on the Environmental Division's conclusion that, in fact, the Green River is already supporting high-quality aquatic habitat. The first is that, the first and most important one is that the Environmental Division's interpretation of high-quality aquatic habitat is, is Morrisville's, essentially. The lower court should have deferred to the agency's interpretation of what that means and how you developed conditions to protect high-quality aquatic habitat in line with all this court's principles of, of deference. In addition, the other thing that the Environmental Division relied on was this IBI that, that Morrisville had done, the Index of Biotic Integrity, where Morrisville's expert went out and did an assessment of the biota in the river. Morrisville said and conceded at trial that one cannot rely on an IBI to independently determine that a water is meeting the aquatic life use. And in addition, and very importantly in here, when it comes to high quality aquatic habitat, we cannot rely on that for setting conditions. We have to look to the hydrology criteria, which specifically provide that there should be site-specific flow studies done and that that should in, needs to include an assessment of habitat in relation to flow. And so the environmental division, one, shouldn't have relied on the IBI, and two, should have deferred to the agency's development of conditions to protect that habitat. Does that deference, I mean, you know, one of the points we see in the briefing on that issue as well, if this is like the agency policy as to what high quality uh, water means, then why isn't it in a regulation or a handbook or, I mean, it's, it, this seems to have come out of the testimony of a witness who says they use it sometimes. Is, is that enough of an agency policy to, to trigger the deference? Yes, and when it comes to that specifically, this 80% standard, that goes to the agency's interpretation of its regulations. And the standard is not, is it written down somewhere? The standard is, is the agency's interpretation wholly irrational and unreasonable in relation to the intended purpose of the regulation? And here, of course, the intended purpose of the water quality standards is to protect water quality. Um, the court, and, the, and actually in the CLF petition case from this court that came out 
Last year, there were additional factors uh, regarding when an agency receives deference on interpreting its regulations, including is it, um, does it lead to unjust and unreasonable results? Is, are there compelling indications of error? And here, there weren't any compelling indications of error. As the agency witness testified, a &R has looked to the standard before. According to the literature, it's the value below which, 80% is the value below which stress levels begins to occur in species. So it's very important to at but least. The problem is the court is exercising its discretion as to how much deference to afford an agency interpretation. And he gives reasons. He gives reasons why he's not buying into the 80% of the total maximum habitat, et cetera. There's no, uh, it's undefined in the Vermont Water Quality and, or any other formal document. There's no specific sources cited for the testimony. There are a variety of other factors that influence fish populations. It's not as if he just said, I don't care what the agency thinks. I'm going this way. He gave us reasons. So what deference do we give to the trial judge on, the, as we would in fact finding? The, well, the standard of review regarding the standard of review is de novo. And that was, I believe, stated in the court's Plum Creek decision. So this court looks at how the environmental division um, did or didn't defer to the agency de novo. And those factors that the environmental division listed for not deferring to the agency's interpretation of its own regulations aren't factors in this court's precedent. Um, that this, according to this court's precedent, again, the question is, was the agency's interpretation wholly irrational and unreasonable in relation to its intended purpose? So we believe it should stand. I would like to leave some time for yep. counsel for VNRC. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, you understand that timekeeping is to your right. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, okay. Your Honor. Yep. May it please the court. My name is Jill Witkowski Heaps, and I represent Appellants, Vermont Natural Resources Council, and Vermont Council of Trout Unlimited. One third of a mile. Can you picture that in your mind's eye? If you're like me and you need um, visual cues to, to judge distances, let me help you out. If you um, leave school today and you look to the right past the post office, there's a set of railroad tracks at the end of town. If you start at those railroad tracks, walk through town, walk across campus, walk over the White River Bridge, and end up at the intersection of 14 where the gas station is. That's one third of a mile, 1,690 feet. That's the length of the Lamoille River that for the past 125 years has frequently been dry because of the operation of the Katie's Falls hydroelectric facility. We have a word for the man-made or man-induced alteration of the chemical, physical, biological, or radiological integrity of water. The Clean Water Act calls that pollution. This 401 water quality certification is our one opportunity for a generation to address the pollution of the Lamoille River by the Katie's Falls hydroelectric facility. And when I say one opportunity this generation, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. The 401 requi certification requirements will be incorporated into the FERC license, and those licenses typically last 30 to 50 years. Does that mean that there was a 401 certification 30 years ago? The last 401 certification was in 1981. And, and have the standards changed, or, or has the natural flow changed? I mean, how did it, this get approved 30 years ago? Yeah, you know, I, I actually asked counsel for the agency that when we were first looking at this, and my best understanding is that the, um, the guidance has greatly improved. The PUD case by the United States Supreme Court was in 1994, um, and so many of the regulations and the understanding of how we um, work together with the designated uses and um, as they apply to dams has greatly evolved. Um, but so have the conditions yes. changed much? What was that? Have the conditions in this specific, <laughs> this particular stretch of water changed much? Um, Your Honor, I'm not familiar with, um, I don't think the record reflects that, um, so perhaps the agency would be able to provide more information about that on, on rebuttal. When we come to this relicensing and this once every 30 years, do we start with a clean slate and pretend as if the dams don't exist and we're deciding whether to allow them, or do we start with the reality that the dams are there and we're deciding whether um, keeping them is going to degrade the water? Um, Your Honor, the first thing we have to look at, the 401 requires compliance with water quality standards. And as PUD and the Supreme Court has showed us, um, existing dams must comply with um, designated uses. That comes straight out of the PUD case. So once it's, um, 
a dam is complying with designated uses and you're in uh, tier two anti-degradation land, there may be opportunities to balance um, the, the hydroelectric um, generation, but the very bare minimum is our, is our de designated uses. The Environmental Division made an error of law by rolling back the 100 cubic feet per second requirement that the Agency of Natural Resources determined was necessary to meet the Lamoille River's designated use and rolled it back to 65.5 cubic feet per second. The error of law that the Environmental Division made was that it saw a conflict between the designated use requirements and the anti-degradation policy that does not exist. These these sections work together to ratchet up water quality protection. They're not balanced against each other. And I'd like to briefly walk through four reasons why we know that this is true. The first is in the Vermont's anti-degradation policy itself. The very first provision of the policy in section 103A says, all water shall be managed in accordance with these rules to protect, maintain, and improve water quality. Anti-deg is used to ratchet up protections, not to lower them. The second um, piece of this is, but this ratchet up versus lowering goes into the existing use, right? If, if, if our baseline is the dam is there, then we are ratcheting it up because we're increasing the flow significantly over what it's been. If the baseline against which we're measuring it is no dam, then, then we're reducing it. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm sort of struggling with in, in construing that language. Yes. So, um, the, the way that this works is we, you know, this dam was built in the late 1800s. Um, so this gives an opportunity for the state to correct the, de the decisions that weren't made properly in the late 1800s. Um, a PUD case was about a new dam, but there it even recognized that the EPA regulations say existing dams must comply with designated uses. And that's, um, there they cite 40 CFR 131.10 G4 for that. Um, EPA has also recognized anti-deg as a floor of water quality. In the Federal Register notice in November 8, 1983, EPA says, this provision establishes the absolute floor of water quality in all waters of the United States. In a place where there's higher water quality, um, those provisions will prevail. Um, number three, the state has consistently um, interpreted these, these provisions to work together. And in fact, in the existing use section of the Lamoille River Basin Plan, the, the plan states, under the anti-deg policy of the Vermont water quality standards, if the agency identifies a water body with one or more uses that exceed the classification criteria for the designated use class, then those uses shall be protected to maintain a higher level of water quality. So if an existing use is below the designated use, it doesn't matter. If it's above the designated use, then the, that's when the existing uses will be, um, the water quality protections will be ratcheted up to protect them. And then finally, the United States Supreme Court case has spoken directly to this issue in the PUD case. Um, two important things that it said there. Number one, it said, quote, under the literal terms of the statute, a project that does not comply with the designated use of the water does not comply with water quality standards. A 401 certification must show that it complies with water quality standards, and if you don't meet the designated uses, you haven't met that requirement. Number two, the court said EPA regulations, quote, expressly require existing dams to be operated to attain designated uses. That speaks directly here. And the third point is what the court didn't say. The court actually talked about anti-degradation policy, and the Environmental Division actually even cited PUD about anti-degradation policy. But what the court didn't say, it didn't say, with new dams, we have to comply with designated uses, but once a dam is there, then we have to balance the designated use against the existing use. The court didn't say that. The court said existing dams comply with designated uses. For this reason, these four reasons, we asked this court to reinstate the 100 cubic feet per second flow requirement in the Lamoille River below Katie's Falls. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Council. Please, the court. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. It's great to be back down at Vermont Law School. Um, I'm here on the narrow issue of the environmental court's decision to allow the releases for whitewater uh, loading uh, in the Green River, um, not the other two dams. I want to open by addressing deference. Um, only now, before this court, does ANR concede that whitewater boating is an existing use. Uh, before that, it just wasn't in the record, and ANR missed it. So. In short, there's just nothing to defer to, at least insofar as whitewater boating is concerned. Uh, ANR did no work re regarding whitewater boating. ANR did not consider whether or not the releases would um, have an impact on biota or not. So there's simply nothing to defer to. 
Whose burden is it? Excuse me? Whose burden is it? Say in ours burden. Um, the Clean Water Act's pretty clear. All uses, designated uses, existing uses, need to be maintained and protected. Whitewater boating is an existing use. Um, there's no evidence whatsoever to indicate that whitewater boating is somehow incompatible with the other uses. I think the record is pretty clear. It is compatible. We have uh, the cross-examination of Mr. Crocker, um, which indicates that uh, there's no problem with an appropriate release um, in terms of the release being consistent with uh, the other uses. Uh, we have the testimony of Mr. O'Keefe, Dr. O'Keefe, who said the same thing, provided extensive testimony on that. I, I understand a &R to be taking the position that, no, we don't actually protect existing uses. We protect the level of water quality associated with existing uses. Yes. And what I'm trying to get my head around is in the context of the whitewater rafting, mm -hmm. the quality of water that we're talking about really is a how artificial abilities to influence the flow of the water are going to be exercised yeah. in terms of scheduled releases. How do you respond to the notion that if our goal is to get as close to natural flow as possible, scheduled releases on a weekend day don't meet that criteria? Well, you know, ANR's proposed flow regime kind of shaves off the peak flows in the springtime and in other times. And, you know, having those peak flows once We say shaves while. off, meaning it forces them to get flowed downstream right off? Well, it, 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 the, the reservoir is getting refilled, so you never reach the peak flows Got that you it. would normally see. Got it. And you need those peak flows in order to maintain the habitat because the, the peak flows kind of clear up the silt that gets between the gravel, things like that. Um, Mr. O'Keefe's, Dr. O'Keefe's testimony in, um, <clears throat> explained that as well. Um, the testimony before the environmental court was that the peak flows are entirely consistent fully compatible, indeed foster a better uh, habitat. And so the, you know, it's ironic in terms of water quality, you know, this whole case is about whether quality and quantity are one and the same. You know, people need, you need water, you need a certain amount of water in order to maintain <clears throat> habitat, you need a certain amount of water to maintain recreation. Uh, there's no difference here uh, between maintaining the use, the recreational use, which is a designated use as well as the existing use of uh, whitewater boating um, and maintaining the habitat. They're compatible. Is that, is that fact significant? In other words, I I if we embraced your argument, does that force us to embrace more so water and lights argument that um, the dam is an existing use that has to be protected? No. And why not? What's the difference? Um, recreation is one of the uses that's, uh, that's a designated use under the Clean Water mm -hmm. Act. Whitewater boating is an existing use. So there's some question as to whether or not the dam is an existing use. So, you know, I, I want to address the, um, you know, the ANR's characterization that whitewater recreation is manufactured. You know, the, the, Green River Res Re the Green River Reservoir is manufactured. Canoeing on the Green River Reservoir is, is a manufactured use. Stocking trout is manufactured. Um, the flows are all manufactured. And, you know, if if you're going to have a flow regime that shaves off um, most of the time the peak flows, in many ways this is just mitigation for that flow regime. You know, to have three scheduled releases to uh, that would have an impact on the recreational use of the Green River. Um, the, having those uh, the scheduled releases mitigates that. Seems and to me both sides are a little bit arguing the facts to us on whether these scheduled releases are going to be good or not from the aquatic biota. Isn't isn't that ultimately a question for the trial court? Um, it is, and the the trial court addressed it. The trial court ordered their scheduled releases, and I think the testimony was, uh, you know, was it was not contested. If you look at Mr. Crocker's cross examination, if you look at Mr. Wentworth's cross examination by American Whitewater. Um, there's no indication that scheduled releases would be incompatible uh, with the flow regime, either a &R's flow regime or more so water lights flow regime. So unless the court has any other questions, I'll be ceding the rest of my time with them. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to thank the court for coming uh, to Vermont Law School. Uh, this is where I graduated 26 years ago and the first time arguing before this court here, so it, it's a great honor. Just like home. It is sort of just like home, yep. sort of a homecoming, yes. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to start with uh, a point Justice Robinson made, which is 
you know, do you look at whether this, you know, the dam before the dam was there, you know, or assume that it was never there and then build, or uh, you know, look at the dam that's actually been there for, in, in several cases, um, in the Morrisville case, I believe, uh, almost 100 years, or at least 80, 90 years. Um, and part of the problem here is A&R, um, in the way they've approached this case, and the way they've interpreted um, their own regulations and application um, of the water uh, quality standards, um, is to almost ignore the fact that uh, this is a dam, that this is a hydroelectric facility that creates renewable energy that under ANR procedures, um, which is, I'm referring to the stream flow procedure, um, is a, a beneficial for the state of Vermont, that it's actually one of the, the policy goals of the state of Vermont to um, encourage and to increase the use of renewable energy. And under the Clean Water Act, which the ANR is implementing as its sort of state approver of permits, uh, is the state allowed to um, overlay its policy goals of renewable energy over the quality requirements of the Clean Water Act? I believe it is in certain circumstances. And, and let, let, me, let me explain. I, I'll get right to the anti-degradation argument. Um, part of it is I believe that the ANR's interpretation wants to selectively apply um, the anti-degradation policy. And this was adopted and approved, approved by the EPA, adopted by uh, the state of Vermont. Um, there are cases, um, and I believe there's this one case, I believe it's the Northwest Environmental Advocates, um, where they challenged um, the EPA's approval of an anti-degradation implementation plan because it didn't, um, they, in their mind, did not comply with the Clean Water Act. This is not the case here. So what we have is we have uh, 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 standards that have been approved by the EPA um, and have been promulgated by Vermont for, for um, in this case, 2014. But this iteration of the anti-deg uh, provision has been in there for quite a while. And it specifically protects um, existing uses, the water, the level of water quality, water quality level necessary to protect existing uses shall be protected and maintained. Um, there's no qualifiers in that. Um, and I believe, as you know, Attorney Murphy conceded that these, or Attorney uh, Heaps conceded that these, these are supposed to work together. Well, the ANR is one of the, one of the problems that I believe the Environmental Division had with the ANR's interpretation is that under their interpretation, you could actually eliminate an existing use. And indeed, Mr. Crocker testified at the trial that under certain circumstances, you could eliminate an existing use, which I don't find anywhere in the water quality. And so standard. you're defining the dam for which you're seeking a permit as an existing use. I mean, it, so, so, so yeah. that, that's incongruous. Then, in other words, once you get in there, uh, even though you have to get relicensed by FERC and repermitted under the Clean Water Act, you've got a, you're essentially in for life because you got in 30 years ago. Why do we even do the repermitting if that's true? Well, because you still have to, and I'm not, I'm not saying because we have a, an existing use that we can discharge whatever we want. Um, and in fact, it, just to sort of, uh, briefly about the facts, um, we have three facilities, and then the reservoir is a different situation, but we have the Morrisville facility, which um, the overwhelming testimony um, and evidence was that 43 CFS, which was which the judge adopted based on the evidence, um, meets the aquatic biota. So it meets the designated uses, so there's no need to really balance under the anti-deg policy. The same thing for the Green River. So what we're really talking about is the Cady's Falls, and not whether you say, well, we've been operating this way for forever, um, and currently Katie's Falls does not have um, a conservation uh, bypass flow. Um, so it's been operating with, without any um, restrictive on the, on the bypass flow. Um, so our position is not, well, we can do whatever we want. Our position is that, yes, we're going to look first to say, okay, does this, does this support the flows we're, we're, we're going to propose? Will this support? Um, aquatic habitat, designated use. In certain circumstances, particularly in this Katie's Fault circumstance, the testimony and the evidence was that the, what was necessary, the level of water quality, in this case flow, that would be necessary to protect and maintain the existing use of hydroelectric power, really was, was, was needed to be less. Um, because what happened when you went to the 100 CFS, and this is the testimony that the judge made a factual finding about, um, that a loss of 21% of energy generation, renewable energy generation, didn't protect the so existing use. What do you do with the PUD case, which seems to suggest a couple of times that uh, dams got, have to protect designated uses, uh, whether they're existing or not? Well, that's, I, a, that that's a floor. Yeah, and the, and the PUD, case, PUD case also talks about 
um, existing uses not being degraded. And so the, the whole point is that the de de degradation really doesn't refer, as I first started this case, I thought, oh, this must refer to the level of water quality, but really what it refers to is the degradation of the existing use. And so under the Vermont water quality standards, because the states are actually tasked with, in, in circumstances where they want to adopt their own water quality standards, the states are the ones that, in essence, set the standards for a 401 certification. And what we have is we have an anti-degradation policy that specifically provides commercial activities um, our existing uses. Um, they don't have to have that in there. Um, that could have been something that you know, some states, I think some states don't have it. Um, but it is in there. Well, um, it's, more, it's more than just being a commercial enterprise that makes you an existing use. Yes. There's, it seems to me that in your brief you ignored the, the discretion that ANR can use in looking at the separate factors that can help it decide if. So there's, there's existing and then there's whether it's going to be protected or not. So it might be existing in the sense of the word existing that it was there, but then you need to look at the factors to determine whether it should be protected. And you don't subscribe to this idea that the dam has to have a, require a higher quality of water to be an existing use? Well, and, and what we don't subscribe to, and, I, and, and first, uh, Justice Carroll, I'll, I'll say that if you look at um, the language of the anti-degradation, the evidence was, um, and th those factors are, is it a commercial activity which depends upon the preservation of an existing level um, of high quality level of water? Um, not high quality waters is defined in the water standards, which are more sort of pristine water. This more is more than a designated use. Um, than the water quality required by a designated use. The, the ANR interpretation is that you can only, you, basically you cannot degrade or lower any designated use to protect an existing use unless the existing use, the level of water quality necessary to protect that is higher than the designated use. And what I would say is that's nowhere in um, the regulation. It's nowhere in the statute. Um, and, 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 and here's the, when I look at this, why does balancing make sense? Um, because what do you do when you have the conflict between the existing use and the designated use? Um, logic says, well, you got to balance the two then. And, and well, how do I, where do I get that from? And I get that from an agency procedure, um, which is what we refer to as the stream flow procedure, um, which was, uh, I believe, promulgated in 1993. But it does give an insight um, as to what ANR may have been thinking at the time, um, and it's still a valid procedure. And that procedure, um, in the general procedure portion, um, part C, part E, and part F, talks about actually lowering um, standards, even that may be lower than necessary to protect fisheries, to accommodate other beneficial uses of the water. And um, leaving aside whether that's, under the CWA, a requirement of law that the court should consider or ANR should consider, um, if it's inconsistent with what the um, Clean Water Act and the Vermont standards require, how can we uh, impose that over those standards? Well, I, I don't believe it's inconsistent. The reason I don't believe it's inconsistent is because when I, when I looked at the regulations and I looked at the anti-degradation policy, the reading that I take out of that is when you already have a situation where the waters themselves are of high enough quality or higher than necessary to support the designated uses, then can you go in and lower them? And so. In that instance, it, it appears it's, not, it's talking about something other than the Class B waters, where water levels are already high. Um, in this instance, we have a situation where there's been a dam there, again, getting back to the point of do we ignore the fact that there's a dam there. Um, we've had a dam there for, um, all, I don't, I don't want to say the years, but a lot of years. Um, and I, I, I fear that the problem is when you, when you look at this and you say, OK, we're, we're not really protecting then existing uses. or ANR can determine what existing uses they're going to protect and what they're not um, based on something that doesn't seem to have any standards, um, no established practice, um, no written guidelines with respect to hydro facilities specifically. In fact, the stream flow procedure talks about hydro facilities and talks about accommodating them. You've talked about this balancing and you've invoked common sense as the source of, of your understanding as to why that's what you do. The Clean Water Act has two distinct places where it actually invites that kind of balancing. This isn't one of them. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, if, 
if you wanted to make the case that you can't you can't get to the level of water quality, meaning flow, that are required to support the aquatic biota, um, you could always seek a non-attainment ruling or whatever the language is, essentially lower the class of the water, and that's the context in which you can bring in your arguments as to the, the other uses for the water and why this is a good thing. Isn't, isn't that the right procedure to try to save the dam if it can't be managed incompatibly with the uh, water quality standards? My reading, Your Honor, at least of those provisions, seems is to be when you already have the water level there is higher than necessary to protect the designated uses, and the issue is then can you lower that? Right. That's one of the. That's one of yeah. the two places. But the non-attainment determination. The non-attainment determination. Um, you except in this case, the uh, issue is of a water quality certification is really dependent on the state of Vermont and A and R issuing the water quality certification. And the whole issue in this case was never, does this comply with you know, the Clean Water Act regs? The whole issue was, does this comply with Vermont water quality standards? But shouldn't we be, so are you suggesting that if Vermont quality standards, we can construe them to be incompatible with the federal laws for which Vermont is the implementing agency? No, no, what, what, what I'm saying is when you look at the Vermont water quality standards and the anti-degradation policy, it, and what the court found was that ANR's interpretation would essentially eliminate an existing use. Um, and again, these, these things don't take place in a vacuum, and, and that, that was my concern during the trial, is the ANR's position was, well, this, we, we don't really care whether you can generate or not. We don't really care about the dam. We're just going to look at one thing. And beneficial uses of water um, are, are, are... If we were starting from scratch, if there wasn't an existing dam there, and... and uh, you were seeking a permit to build a dam. Would you agree that the permit would have necessarily required a higher flow requirement at Katie Falls? Absolutely. Yes. Um, and, and that's and, and because there's the dam there, and and and, I'm, and I know there's the, the common sense. There's been, there hasn't been much law there, but there's a, a main case, and the reason I cited the main case it was the only thing after I missed it like four or five times of research, and then it came up. Um, but the only time um, I've seen, I think anyone, uh, the other council have seen, where a court even took this issue of balance, well, what do we do when there's an argument that they conflict? Um, and they balance, and, and uh, admittedly in that case they found that, yeah, we balance, but you know, the hydroelectric facility still loses on this one. Um, but when you look also at, well, what is, the, what is ANR saying? Because the big issue here is ANR's interpretation of the anti-degradation policy, well, they don't have an established interpretation, an established practice, any written policy or policy regarding this issue that has come into evidence. And so in Plum Creek, did they, I'm trying to remember, did, did the forestry department have a written policy that described how you measure the calipers of the trees? I'm not sure in Plum Creek, Your Honor. I do know in the Coro case, uh, oh, was that Coro? Plum Creek? No, sorry. Uh, the Coro case, there was a technical, uh, written technical guidance um, which to me, um, if I could just briefly talk about the uh, um, deference issue, is uh, when you, I, I read Coro um, over and over again, and, and really I was, I, was, I was struck by the differences um, between that case and this case. Um, you take the high quality aquatic habitat, it's not defined um, in the water quality standards. It, it, it could have been. Um, it was testimony in, in, by Mr. Wentworth, the, the, the fisheries um, expert, who said it's not a policy. Um, there's no written policy on it. Um, it was really just one employee's interpretation at what might be reasonable. Does Coro the say there has to be a written policy? No. Mm -hmm. But I think Coro does say there has to be an or, or doesn't it, it says that it points to the fact that there was an established practice. And I, the term established practice um, comes up again and again. And let me just give you an example, if I, if I may, of why I, if this is a problem when you have these sort of ad hoc determinations. Um, part of this case was the phase-in. Morrisville had requested a phase-in that it be allowed to because it's going to take some time to make the modifications of the facilities, that it be allowed to have a phase-in of it, of these conditions over uh, several years. Um, I think we wanted 10 years, and I think the court gave us four. Um, and Mr. Crocker's position during the trial and even before was that, you know, no, the water, our interpretation of the Vermont water quality standards is you don't get a phase in, in the certification. Well, we found out that just a few years before, 
remounted power, A&R had interpreted the provision because there was a different person in Mr. Crocker's position, had interpreted the water quality standards, at least in that instance, to allow for a phase-in. Um, and the testimony at trial on cross was that, well, you know, interpretations can change, um, depends on who's in the position. But I always try, you know, the, the, the prior stream flow coordinator always tried to be, he always was doing the same interpretation with everyone he dealt with, but then the problem is interpretations can change. And so Morrisville was in the position of saying, well, wait a minute, remounted power two years ago, you allowed them to have, uh, to have a phase in, and you're not allowing us to have a phase in. And so uh, that part wasn't appealed. Um, is there any sort of comparable inconsistency where there's a prior case where the agency has taken a position in, in conflict with the 80% preservation of the 80% of the natural habitat? Not that I'm aware of, Your Honor. But, but the concern is, unless it's a policy, like in, in Coro, there was a technical guidance. And, and interestingly, the technical guidance said, we're adopting this technical guidance, um, but this is from the decision, uh, for the sake of clarity um, and to have a, a, a clear, consistent, uh, broadly accepted definition of what determines whether something's in a floodway. So if we buy the argument that there has to be a written policy, how does ANR ever interpret this, um, give a definition to the high quality water? I mean, if, if there's no written policy, they have to decide it at some point, right? And that might prompt them to put it in a written policy. But, but are they, they just get no discretion on it because it's not in writing? They, they do get discretion, Your Honor, but I think you have to go back to the language of established practice. And if there was testimony, and this comes down a lot to testimony, if there was testimony that, yes, when we deal, because they do water quality certifications all the time, this is nothing new. When we deal with our water quality certifications for the past 10 years, or whatever the testimony would have been, that it's our established practice, we require 80%. Wasn't there evidence in the record that they did in the past consider it? That, that it was considered, it, it, we have considered that in the past. But again. But like Justice Robinson said, no evidence that they considered it differently in, a diff in another context. No. But as far as proof, you know, the burden of proving whether I think they have a, some sort of established practice that requires deference, I wouldn't say that that was our burden. Um, but, but the problem is, what if there's a different person? My concern is, you know, sort of getting back to the phase in analogy. There's a different person in, in that same position and says, well, you know what, I know we did 80% before, but I'm really hardcore and I want 95%. Um, and, and how does, how do people you know, do business, rely on, I mean, the, the way people conduct themselves in, in the world is to rely on, they know, okay, you know, we're gonna have to you know, make sure that all these are 80% or wh whatever a is requiring. I'm not saying they have to do it forever, but it, to have some sort of policy or established practice that you can look to, you can defer to, because right now there's really nothing to defer to other than what someone has said for the purposes of this litigation. Right. They well, were tying it to the stress level. Excuse me? They were tying it to the stress level of the species. The, the stress level of species, yes, but, and, and that's true. Um, but there was, again, there was testimony, and this is where you get to sort of the, core, the second part of CORA, which was the weight of the evidence. And um, I believe Attorney Murphy said, well, our position was that the IBI, you know, you can't, you can't rely on it to establish aquatic habitat. Um, and that really wasn't the case, and we didn't just rely on the fish population study. We relied on the fish population study, which is set forth in the bio-criteria of the remote water quality standards as a way to measure aquatic habitat. And in addition, we did the full, what's called the IFIM, in-stream flow incremental methodology, which according to the USGS requires both their sort of steady state modeling and the time series, which is looking at flows over time, which is something Mr. Perry did um, for all the facilities. And so part of the, the other problem issue we had is, well, wait a minute, we don't want to, here's your procedure, and we're supposed to follow it. Um, we follow it, and you say, well, you know, we're not going to take into account the fact that you did this IBI. We're not going to take into account a time series analysis, even though that's in the water quality standards. So you, it, it's sort of like trying to navigate um, all these uncertainties where I, I don't believe the law requires you know, total certainty, but enough certainty that people like Morrisville or, or companies like Morrisville could know what to expect um, and, and to be treated fairly because there's, um, there's definitely a fairness issue which was acknowledged through the witnesses at trial that Morrisville says, hey, I, I want to phase in too, just like Green Mountain Power. It's like, well, well, that was the person in charge before. There was more to the deference argument by ANR, though, with respect to um, 
interpreting that language. Um, not only did you take issue with this 80 percent um, rule that um, ANR used, but ANR also um, looked at the data and dismissed um, your client's position because it was not taking into account every species at every stage of life and that you had averaged them all together to come up with a number. And it wasn't it given the purposes of ANR in this type of 401 certification, wasn't it reasonable for them to consider every species at every stage of life when it made its determination? Yes. And, and in fact, w w the, the, that's sort of a, I, I think maybe a bit, bit of a misunderstanding on the part of ANR is when you looked at the, the, the exhibit that was presented and the work that uh, Mr. Perry and, and Ms. Nealon did, um, they did the overall average, but in those charts um, that, was in that were in evidence, there were averages for each selected species as well. So you got a sense of, um, okay, but, what do But at they averaged all the different stages of life. Yes. But they were, they, were, they were broken out. So it wasn't sort of like, hey, see, we've only averaged 80 percent and we're not showing you the rest. We show the rest. And, and that really gets to why, you know, does it have to be 80 percent for every single species? What is, how do you define high quality aquatic habitat? Um, and that just seems that that would be something perfect for a technical guidance that says, we're going to we're gonna do this for the purposes of clarity and consistency. So when all these other water uh, quality certifications that are coming up, um, people will know. And it, it, it not only gets rid of a lot of, you know, uh, have a argue uh, a trial, but it, uh, it, it gives people uh, something to guide them. So leaving, leaving aside um, whether it's in writing or not, or whether it's clear they've applied these, um, this definition before, there were this interpretation before, do you think that ANR was reasonable in making this 80% determination and requiring numbers that would um, uh, prolong the fish population by each species and species and each um, life stage. Uh, you think it was reasonable? I, I'm not a scientist, but, but I can't. As a as a as a as a lawyer standing before you here today, I would I would say I don't think it's reasonable because when we did the full again the full IFIM analysis, which requires that sort of steady state modeling, as well as looking at the flows, variable flows over time, we sort of did the complete picture. And that's how we came to our conclusions. If ANR had done all that, or their own assessment came back and said, hey, we did this full time series analysis too, and your expert's just not right, then I would say, okay, well, you know, we, we can at that point, you know, y then you're getting into challenging ANR's methodology, how they went about it, but we, that wasn't the case here. They just didn't do the full methodology. and so. It get back, gets back to the point, if there's no policies, they sort of do an ad hoc, that's what we have in this case, not generally, um, or, well, we're only going to selectively apply our policies, and, and that was the, that, that's, that's the concern, and that's why I would say in this case, Your Honor, it's not reasonable. I'm not saying a is unreasonable generally, I'm just saying in this particular instance. And, the, and the, I'm sorry to keep drilling this, but the, the notion that they're selectively applying their policies, and that's a significant, that would be a significant argument. I'm trying to grab onto where we have the evidence that they've selectively applied this, where we can point say, see, they didn't do it here, they didn't do it here. Oh, th th that is in the transcript you're in, our you're in our briefing, to okay. show that they didn't require, you know, they, they, we, we did the full IFM IM analysis, they didn't. Um, that I know, but, but the 80 percent thing, you, you, the, 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 having that be the, the, the standard, there's no other case where they've said, no, that's not the standard, or we're applying some different standard. They just, we have a, a blank slate on that question. We, that is a blank slate, Your Honor. There's nothing that I, that came up, that came into evidence or we were aware of at the time of trial, or even now, truthfully. Um, so I can't say that, but what I can say is we need some sort of certainty. Uh, the one issue, though, that it's very interesting, when they did um, the modeling, so um, ANR did a modeling that showed, it was a dual flow analysis, taking the highest and lowest flows. It showed no fish in the Green River, areas of the Green River, um, not the whole Green River. And we showed, the fish population showed actual fish. Again, reality versus modeling. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'm sorry I spoke too long. <laughs> no, you didn't. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Does the appellant have time? The appellant has seven minutes and 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you. I'll just make a few points, and I do want to leave time for counsel for VNRC. 
So starting with the renewable energy question, Justice Robinson, you had it right. That's already taken into account in the laws that Congress and the state legislature and that the agency implements. In particular, the use attainability analysis of the federal regulation specifically provides that with respect to dams or hydrologic modifications, if there's a dam that's preventing attainment of the use and it is not feasible to operate the dam in a manner that will attain the use, the state can go through a use attainability analysis to remove the aquatic life use subject to approval by EPA. And this, this is also the, the fact that it's already taken into account is actually reflected in the state's comprehensive energy plan as well. Uh, Morrisville cited this in its reply brief. If you go to page 387 of that plan, the number one strategy for hydroelectric is maintain existing hydro to the extent it complies with Vermont's water quality standards. So these factors absolutely already are taken into account. Um, regarding whether something is written, in Woodford Packers, the methodology, the court specifically noted the methodology was not written. In Plum Creek and Jones v. Port Forest Parks and Recreation, I don't believe the court discussed whether it was or was not written at all. With respect to whether the agency followed its water quality standards in developing the flow conditions, and this is, this is the site-specific flow studies and the methodologies that the agency used. This is in the hydrology criteria. We've laid that all out in our reply brief, so I'll just direct the court to that for a sort of clear delineation of how the agency followed its own water quality standards in conducting the studies and its own methodologies. Why and then, hasn't the department um, or the agency uh, established a written protocol on this? Why isn't the 80% rule written down somewhere? Your Honor, I, I don't believe that information is in the record. I don't know the answer to that question, but I think, you know, it, it, it's not, um, it doesn't mean it's not entitled to deference. But doesn't Mr. Eaton, Eaton have a point that it shouldn't be a moving target? Well, there's, there's no evidence that it is a moving target. And to the extent that we're concerned about the regulated entity having sufficient information to put together its application, um, certainly the water quality standards themselves, if they're not standardless, they provide guidance regarding the high quality aquatic habitat, the specific char characteristics of that, protecting all life stages, protecting bi biological integrity, and all functional groups, essentially. Morrisville also, I believe, I believe this is in the record, but started, I think, conversations with ANR as far back as 2010, specifically related to the Gomez and Sullivan studies. So these were the studies that Morrisville and the agency agreed on together to conduct. So the conversations with the agencies started back in 2010 and have been ongoing until the final certification was issued. In addition, it is in the literature the level below which the stress levels begin to occur, so Morrisville should have been aware of it. So in terms of fairness and notice, that shouldn't be a concern here for the court. I'm still struggling with this, this, this notion of, of quality because it includes flow when I get, when I get to the whitewater rafters. And I'm, I, there's not a clear, you've said no, it's not more flow is always better or less flow is always better. And, and so trying to figure out whether this existing use is uh, promotes, degrades, is compatible with the natural regime. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to understand how you fit that into the concept of higher quality water or less high quality water. So I think it really comes down to the way in which we protect an existing use. And the way we protect the existing use is by providing the level of water quality that's needed. And that's in reference to the natural conditions. So. Whitewater boating, the lower court decided, is an existing use, so it needs to be supported. So what that means, the real question here is, are there sufficient natural high flows, natural high flows being passed downstream in order to support the use? Under the agency's conditions, during most of the year, every flow above 60 CFS, and I think whitewater boating requires at least 120 um, or 128, every flow above that number has to be passed downstream. Right, but that so could be three in the morning on a Tuesday. It could be, but that's consistent with the natural regime. The, the well, no, that's what I'm trying to figure The natural regime, you don't even have a reservoir there. And I'm trying to figure out what the frequency of water flows of that magnitude would be in the natural regime and whether it would actually be far more than under the regime that you're proposing and whether the scheduled releases are sort of a way of making up for that. I think if the court were to decide that the agency's conditions aren't sufficient to support whitewater boating, 
the remedy would probably be to remand back to the agency to conduct that type of analysis rather than going back to the environmental division, remand back to the agency to conduct in the first instance. This court has done that before. I believe it was in one of the CLF stormwater cases, and I don't have the, the name of the case handy, but if the court is concerned about that, that would probably be the proper approach. And then just one final point, that yes, the standard is this dam has to meet water quality standards, regardless of whether it's existing or not, the same standards apply. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just let's get a uh, report on the time. How much time? Oh, I have two minutes remaining. Two. Okay. Thank you. I have two brief points. Number one, an existing use can be removed if doing so uh, improves water quality. We address this in page 26 of our brief. Uh, 40 CFR 131.10H says existing uses may be removed if, quote, a use requiring more stringent criteria is added. EPA also directly addressed this by saying, quote, the regulation prohibiting removal of an existing use is not intended to apply to a situation where the state wishes to remove a use where removal would result in improving the condition of a water body. Finally, I'd like to address, um, quote, Senator Muskie, who was quoted by the United States Supreme Court in the S.D. Warren case at 547 U.S. 386. Senator Muskie, when first adopting 401, said, quote, no polluter will be able to hide behind a federal license or a permit as an excuse for a violation of water quality standard. No polluter will be able to make major investments in facilities under a federal license or permit without providing assurance that the facility will comply with water quality standards. But no state water pollution control agency will be confronted with a fait accompli by an industry that has built a plant without consideration of water quality requirements. And that's at 116 Congressional Record 890, 8984 from 1970. Thank you. Thanks very much.